Joy 
together. For CAP Debt Center, it's a Christians Against Poverty, and we're raising $30,000. This money is going to go towards a part-time staff person, which you're going to hear an announcement about later in the service, as well as office equipment and CAP Canada administrative costs. Okay, This is over and above our normal tithes and offerings. And uh, 
as always, there's four ways to give here when you're here at Faith. You can go to the back to the Connection Center and pick up an envelope marked Christmas, or you can take your envelope here and write Christmas on it, as well as the online and text to give option. Now, if you're doing that, make sure when you write your dollar amount, let's say you wrote like $79, and then beside it, write the word Christmas, okay, and then hit send. You can check out all the details for that and information about the CAP Debt Center on our website, faithmuskoka.ca backslash give. Okay, so as the ushers come, let me pray for our offering and our Christmas campaign. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to come and worship you, both in song and in giving and in listening to your word. Father, I pray that as we give our offering and as we give towards the Christmas campaign, that you would bless those and use them to your will. And we pray this in your name. Amen. All right. Who has a red sock? Okay. They are due back today and next week. Now, we have done so well, we only need 92 more to go out today. So make sure that you grab one on your way out and bring it back next week. Okay. Uh, let's grab these. Do you have these invites on your chairs? If you want to pick that up for a second and take a look at it. On this side, we're going to talk about the family skate, which is coming up on December 16th. And that will be from 12 to 2 at the Summit Center. Um, we are sponsoring the public skate this year, as we did last year. And if anyone came last year, they know it was a great time. We had a fantastic time connecting with neighbors and friends and just the community. So invite your friends out to that from 12 to 2 as well. Join us for Christmas Eve at Faith, December 24th. We have 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. It's a great time to invite your friends and really think about who are you going to invite out this year to either of these events. We'd love to just impact and reach those around us. So again, think about who you're going to invite. You know, today is a great day to be here. We are starting a new, starting a new four-point teaching series called Family Portraits. You know, Christmas is such an exciting time, and one of the highlights after you get through presents and food is sitting down with your family and really enjoying them and catching up with your loved ones. This Christmas, we're going to take some time, and we're going to learn and study about the family of Jesus, his ancestors, and those that raised him. You know, there are going to be times that we're going to be shocked, and there are going to be times that we're going to be challenged. But at the end of all this, we are going to be overwhelmed with the love and the grace that God shows to those who come to him. Okay, now, before we get into that teaching series, we're going to take a minute now, and we're going, to, we're going to stand up, and we're going to greet those that you don't know. And I mean, if there's someone five rows over and you don't know them, stand up now, move around, and say, hey, welcome to faith. I'm glad you're here. I hope you guys have a great week at faith. All right, you can be seated. Thank you so much. Hopefully somebody got a lunch invitation out of that. There's a lot of conversation going on there. Kim mentioned about our CAP program, and this is a new program for our church that we're very excited about. Uh, as most of you are quite aware, we live in an area that is... Uh, that struggles economically. We're, uh, it's an interesting uh, place, Muskoka. We have the uh, multi-million dollar homes and uh, cottages on the lakes, but then we have people who are living below the poverty line as well. And so uh, there's a real need for this CAP ministry. Uh, the CAP ministry, just so you know, is not us giving out money to people. Uh, we do have an aspect of our budget that we do that, but that's not CAP. CAP is actually sitting down with people who are really behind the eight ball and are uh, really needing some help to uh, not just budget, but to contact some businesses and so on uh, to uh, get back a paying plan and so on. And so uh, that's 
basically what we're going to do is to set that kind of a situation up. And uh, just so you know, uh, that's not what CAP's about at all. Everything I just said, that's not what CAP's about. Now, honestly, what it's about is leading people to faith and maturity in Jesus Christ. We just use that as an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, with those people. And that, that really is uh, the, the foundation of the, of the CAP uh, ministry. So again, we're very excited about that. As, we, as, we, as Kim mentioned, we do uh, uh, want to announce our part-time staff person. It's Mike Ankeman. Uh, Mike has agreed to work 16 hours a week uh, for us. And so for those of you who don't know Mike, why don't you just stand, Mike? And uh, there's Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So uh, we need to pray for Mike. This is not an easy ministry. Uh, you can get burned out very quickly in this ministry. So pray for him, pray for his family, and pray that God would use this, uh, this service in our community uh, to reach uh, these people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So uh, let's begin with our service with a word of prayer, shall we? Our God and our Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here today and for this whole Christmas season that we can celebrate the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that you'd speak to us through your word. Help us to, to listen to what the Spirit of God is saying to us and then being obedient to that truth. And Father, thank you for allowing us to be a part of the CAP ministry. We're excited uh, about the possibilities of how you can use this in the lives of, of individuals and of families within this community, uh, not only in the temporal sense, but in the eternal sense of them having their lives turned over to Jesus Christ. So we pray that you'll bless Mike. We pray that you'll encourage him, and may we support him. May, we, uh, uh, may he challenge us in our own walk uh, as we seek to reach these people with the gospel of Jesus Christ as well. Continue to lead us now, Father, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. I'd like you to take your Bibles, if you would please, and turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. I'd like you to follow along in your Bibles as I read it from mine. If by chance you forgot your Bibles, uh, the words will appear on the screen behind me, and uh, you can read them there. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Like many of you, when our kids were younger, we had a tradition where we would have a family portrait taken during the Christmas season that later on would be made into a Christmas card. Do any of you have done that or some of you still do that? That's a tradition that we had for a while. And for those of you who practice that uh, now or possibly have done that in the past, you're quite aware of the fact that the typical picture that appears on the card never represents the reality of that moment has nothing to do with what actually went on to get that picture taken. You don't hear the promises of reward to the kids if they just participate, if they just cooperate. And you don't hear the threat of the consequences if they don't sit still and get their picture taken. The choice of outfits, getting dressed in good clothes in the middle of the day, sitting until the picture's taken. Sometimes it seems like it's sitting and sitting and sitting. And that smile that is just as cheesy as it sounds. And the reason that the Christmas portrait is so important is because this picture is going out to relatives who you rarely see, neighbors who you maybe want to impress, and friends who are going through the same torture that you've just gone through in order for them to appear happy and content in their family portraits as well. 
It just seems that in that particular tradition, everybody wants to put their best foot forward to, pray, to portray the ideal and the successful family. Well, it's interesting. When Jesus wanted us to see his extended family portraits, he did not worry about disguising it in any way. In fact, he shows us his family portrait with the warts and all. It's not that he came from an especially horrendous group of relatives. In fact, for the most part, there are some glaring exceptions, but for the most part, when you look at Jesus' family portrait, you discover that, at best, they're just ordinary. Ordinary people just like you and me. And during this Christmas season, as it's already been mentioned, I want to look at some family portraits. And the first two weeks, we're going to camp here in Matthew chapter 1. We're going to discover those who, who, who are part of Jesus' family tree. And, and it's interesting, today especially, but also next week, we're going to discover some names that, of people who we used to say they had a past. There's some skeleton in their closets. Terry, I hate to wake you up. Could you get me a glass of water, please? Thank you so much. Trust me, me and everybody here will appreciate it in just a minute. Uh, that's what we're going to do for the first two weeks. On the third week, we're going to look at the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth and the birth of John the Baptist. And then on our, 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 our last Sunday, uh, actually Christmas Eve, December 24th, which by the way, there's going to be one service on the, in the morning. Uh, I, th where's, I think it's 10.30. Check that. I think it's in your bulletin or your newsletter there. So don't come at 9.15, all right, or you're going to be early. Don't come at 11 or you're going to be late. We're going to be here at 10.30, and we're all going to be together. We're going to bring the kids in and everything, and we're going to have one service to celebrate Christmas. So, and that's going to be on the fourth week where we're going to be looking at uh, Jesus, uh, his adopted dad, Joseph, and, of course, his mother, Mary, and that whole episode as well. One of the things that we'll be reminded as, as we go through this series is that the purpose of Christmas, as you're well aware, is not about the decorations. It's not about the gift giving. It's not even about the Christmas carols that we sing during this time of year, although I personally, I think many of you enjoy all of those things. But the real purpose of Christmas is so that, is so that we can be reminded of the fact that God wanted man to be reconciled to himself. That's really what the purpose of Christmas is all about. It's the account of the love of God that would stop at nothing to provide a means whereby we could be forgiven and have the opportunity to know Him personally. That's really what we're going to talk about at Christmas. Thanks, Terry. I appreciate that. He wasn't asleep, by the way. I was just joking. <laughs> all right? Just joking. The whole message of Christmas could actually be boiled down or summarized in the message that the angel gave to Joseph when he said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. That's what we're focusing on during this entire series, during this entire season. That's what Christmas is all about. And that's where we're going to begin today. Now, I read to you Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. But that's not the passage we're going to look at. That's not the passage we're going to look at this week or next week. Really, what I want us to focus on is verses 1 through 17 of Matthew the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And you notice it begins by saying, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. See, verses 1 through 17 is Jesus' family portrait. This is his family tree. It starts with Abraham. And you notice it ends by saying, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now, for most of us, genealogies are simply a list of, of very long names. And every once in a while, as we do in this passage, we recognize one of those names. But for the most part, they're a group of strangers. In fact, let's be totally honest this morning. You and I probably don't spend a lot of time 
reading the genealogies that occur throughout both the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Maybe if we set as a goal for ourselves to read through the Bible in the year and, and so on, then we'll, we'll, we'll force ourselves to read passages like this. But for the most part, we don't spend a lot of time in the genealogies. Hardly anyone ever memorizes this passage. To my knowledge, nobody's ever set it to music. I don't think there's a Christmas carol that has the genealogies in it. Never appears on a Christmas card. It's like the story of the man who was asked to write a review of the phone book. This was his summary. Great cast of characters, weak plot. <laughs> That's true for us when it comes to the, to the genealogies of Jesus. Great cast of character, but a weak plot. However, for Matthew's primary Jewish readers, this was very important. Now, it's important for us too, as I'll explain in just a moment. But for his Jewish readers, at least primarily Jewish readers, this was extremely important. See, Israel kept very accurate lists of who married whom and what tribe everyone was from. And there was a number of reasons why they did that. First, what tribe you were from determined what land, if any, you could actually buy. They were very careful to protect the old boundaries. In fact, there's a scene in the book of Ruth, most of you have read it, where a man by the name of Boaz must speak to her relative about buying the land that belonged to Naomi. It's not that he was interested in the land of Naomi, but with the land also came the promise of marriage to Ruth. But he had to speak to this relative because he was the next in line to purchase the property. And Boaz wasn't allowed to do it unless this man refused it. He had the right of first refusal of the land. And once he refused it, then Boaz could step in and say, I will buy the land and I will also marry Ruth. See, they took this very seriously. Second reason why they took it so seriously, because the family you belong to determined if you were permitted to become a priest or not. Not just anybody, not just any Jew could be a priest. In fact, you may remember the, the story when, when we studied Nehemiah. They started examining the genealogies, what family you were from and what tribe you were from to determine whether or not you actually qualified to be a priest or not because only those from the tribe of Levi were allowed to be priests. And so they took this very seriously. And a third reason why genealogies were important because it can determine whether or not you are part of the royal line of David. Whether or not you are part of royalty. Just as not any Jew could be a priest, obviously not any Jew could be a king. And so for that reason, they kept very accurate, very careful records, generation after generation, to maintain the purity of their civil as well as their religious offices, to maintain the integrity of the land boundaries. They took it very seriously. For us, the genealogy of Jesus reveals something more than that. This is how one person expressed it. In the genealogies, God weaves his grace. He loves to redeem sinners. He loves to produce something beautiful out of sordid family background. He loves to make foreigners his children. He loves to reconcile his enemies. He loves to make all things work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And when you read through verses 1 through 17 of Matthew 1, you see that come alive. That is exactly what is happening. The former enemies of God have now been reconciled to him. Those who were far from God, who had never dared to claim to be part of the family of God, God reconciled them to himself. It really is an exciting passage when you begin to study, when you begin to study some of the names and, and what happened there. And we're going to do that today, and we're going to do it next week as well. Today we're going to look at the names of the, the four women who are mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, there's actually five counting Mary, but we're going to talk about Mary a few weeks from now, so we're not going to talk about her today. But we are going to talk about these five ladies, just give you a very quick summary of their life, what we know about them, and, and then just a bit of application at the very end. Next week, as I, I mentioned, we're going to look at it again. We're going to look at four men. 
And so uh, they're going to get their due next week. The ladies are going to get their due uh, today. Now, I think as most of you know, the fact that women are mentioned at all in the Jewish genealogy is very unusual. And the fact that these four are mentioned is actually extraordinary. Again, let me give you a brief overview of these ladies and then just make a couple of applications at the end. The first name that is mentioned in the genealogy is is Tamar. Tamar was the daughter-in-law of Judah. Judah was one of the original heads of of the 12 tribes of Israel. He was one of the 12 sons of Jacob, a very significant individual. And she was married to Judah's oldest son, a man by the name of Ur. Now, I can't imagine going through life with a name like Ur. What is your name? Ur. What is your name? Ur. I, I, it must have been so frustrating for him. But at any rate, I don't know what it was like, but at any rate, the Bible says that Ur was wicked in the Lord's sight. So the Lord put him to death. He did evil in the sight of God. And so the Lord put him to death. And according to the law at this time, it was the responsibility of the next in line, the second oldest son, to have children by Tamar. And these children would actually bear the name of the man who died. And that was the law at that time. Well, that's exactly what happened, but I'm not going to go into details, but he also did not please the Lord, and he died. Now, Judah had a third son. But he was very reluctant to allow him to go with Tamar. He thought, boy, this lady's bad luck. There's no way I'm going to let my son go with her. So what he said was, look, he's very young, which he probably was, but, you know, let's wait until he gets older, and then I will send him to you. But apparently he never intended that at all. He was actually lying. And so after waiting a very long time, Tamar took matters into her own hands. She had heard that Judah, who had just recently been widowed, by the way, his wife had just passed away, her father-in-law was actually on, we'll say, a road trip. And discovering where he was going, and this is what the scriptures say, she disguised herself as a prostitute, lured him into her tent, and as a result of their meeting, she fathered twins by him. That's how she was able to have children, which is very important that day. It was her right in that day. Now, it must be one of the most blatant acts of double standards when Judah, who did not recognize her because she was all dressed up, when he he heard that his daughter-in-law was actually pregnant, commanded that she be burnt to death. But then she produced evidence, property that belonged to Judah, and said, this is the man who fathered these children. And Judah had absolutely nothing to, day, nothing to say. And you thought your family was messed up. <laughs> They're not looking so bad right now, are they? And that's the first woman that is mentioned in the family portrait of Jesus Christ. Isn't, it's interesting, isn't it? Notice the next one. Rahab. What's the next two words? The harlot. Yeah. Every time Rahab's name is mentioned, it's always also, she's also referred to as the harlot, the prostitute. Now, Tamar only dressed up as a prostitute. Rahab was one. You may remember the story when Joshua, they're about to go into the promised land. He sent two spies into the promised land to spy out the inhabitants. He wanted to check out what the opposition was like. And they actually stayed at Rahab's place. And she protected them. In fact, she actually indicated that she knew that their God, Jehovah, was the true God. That he was going to be victorious in the battle that was to come. And so she asked them to protect her and her family who would gather in her home. I like how Charles Spurgeon describes her. This is what he says. God has a people where we little dream of it. And he has chosen ones among a sort of people whom we dare not hope for who would think that grace could grow in the heart of one who was a harlot by name as though her sin was openly known to all. Yet it grew there 
like a fair flower blooming upon a dunghill or a bright star glittering on the brow of night. There her faith grew and brought forth glory to God. And when you study the life of Rahab, you understand she really did bring glory to God. She became part of the Jewish nation. She married a a, a Jew, and she actually becomes part of Jesus' family tree. You talk about the grace of God. That's what's being demonstrated here. The next lady, and I have to go quickly through this, is, is, is Ruth the Moabite. Now, Ruth herself, when you read her book that bears her name, Everything you read about her, this was a good woman. This was a great example. Her only problem was that she came from Moab. Moab, the man who fathered the nation, was born as the result of an incestuous relationship between Lot, the nephew of Abraham, and his eldest daughter. That's how the nation got started. And the Moabites and the Israelites were at constant war with one another. But again, the grace of God. Ruth ended up marrying Boaz, who I mentioned just a moment ago, and becomes the great-grandmother of King David. King David. The last woman who's named is not even named. She's simply referred to as Uriah's wife. And most of you know exactly who we're talking about. This is referring to Bathsheba. Bathsheba is the woman who David saw bathing on the rooftop and after inquiring about her, had her come to the palace, slept with her, produced a child at that point that eventually died. You know the rest of the story, how he brought her her husband back and eventually, it's a long story, but eventually even had him killed. It's just a terrible episode in the life of King David. And she's referred to as an adulteress. And I suppose because she's married, we have to call her that. But let me just say, I think she had very little options. When the king says to you, hey, why don't you come on over? Trust me, there's very little else that you can do. I think it would be very difficult to prove mutual consent in that kind of a situation. But regardless, she appears in the family tree of, of Jesus as well. So, so, so why? Why are these names here? What, what is it that God wants us to learn today by including these names? Well, very quickly, there are three things that I want to mention. Number one, it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter where you came from. God loves to redeem you. God wants to save you. So you have the four women who are mentioned here, two for sure were from the enemies of Israel, Rahab and Ruth. And there's even the possibility, in fact, I would say a very good possibility, that the other two were as well. At a time when racial and ethnic discrimination was practiced openly, to have these foreigners included in the Messiah's family tree, Matthew and Jesus was making a huge statement here. See, Jesus is no stranger to prejudicial thought. You remember Nathaniel, one of Jesus' original 12 disciples, almost rejected him because of where Jesus was born. Remember when they came to Nathaniel? And he heard that Jesus was from Nazareth. His first response was, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Can anything of God come from Nazareth? But Jesus doesn't care what side of the tracks you were born on. He doesn't care about your level of education or anything that the world may measure you by. See, we and the Bible declares a gospel that says, whosoever will may come. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whosoever will may come. And don't you allow anyone, and don't you allow any thought that says, God would never accept me. Don't ever allow that to enter your mind. Don't allow that to stop you from becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus came specifically for those of us who are not part of the Jewish nation so that we could be part of the family of God. 
See, we're all sinners in need of the grace of God. And John 6, 37 tells us, all those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. If we will come to Jesus, we have his promise that he will accept us. Second thing we learn from this passage, it doesn't matter what sin you've committed, God can redeem you. Whatever sin is in your past, it doesn't matter. God wants to save you. Hebrews 7 verse 25 says, Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Someone has said he came from a family of sinners to save sinners, but he remained sinless. 1 John 1 verse 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. It doesn't matter what's in your past. If you will come to Jesus, if you will confess your sin, he has promised to receive you and allow you to be part of his family. The third and final thing that I'm going to mention that we learned from these ladies is that it reveals the sovereignty of God. God always has been and always will be in control. He is sovereign over all things. From Abraham to Mary, God orchestrated his plan. What some would consider impossible, even a disaster, God used that to accomplish his ultimate goal, the redemption of the human race. I always think of 1 Corinthians 1 when I think of this particular truth because it says God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world, to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. That's what this passage teaches us. God takes those who the world would have turned against, would have turned aside, He says, no, I want them to be part of my family tree. Let me close with a quote. Each of these women are beautiful old covenant illustrations of what God would later say to Peter when clarifying that his grace is extended to all peoples. What God has made clean, do not call common. And that's his word to you and me. The amazingly good news of Christmas is that Jesus came to make notorious, unclean sinners and foreigners like us, people with disgraceful pasts who believe in his name, clean. That's what God wants to do for us. He wants to make us clean by the blood that he shed upon the cross. That's what we're going to remember right now as we move into the Lord's Supper. That's... Christmas only makes sense when you remember Easter. If you don't consider Easter, Christmas is nothing more than the story of a baby being born. But in addition to Christmas, we also have to remember Easter. And it's on Easter that we remember the cross. It's at Easter that we remember the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us. It's because Jesus came, the Son of God came and died in our place that we have the privilege of being part of his family. I'm not going to dare fathom to say that all of you are in that boat. Maybe some of you are still questioning. Maybe some of you still have not made that decision to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. But for those of us who are part of the family of God, then the Lord's Supper is for us. It's for us to remember everything that Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. So let's just take a moment of silent prayer. You take a moment of silent prayer. Let's go before the Lord and thank God for Christmas as well as for Easter. Let's pray together, shall we?
Our God and our Heavenly Father, we again thank you for these few moments that you give to us that we can read your word, study it, apply it. But also you've given us these few moments that we can remember everything that Jesus Christ has done for us. And we ask, Father, at this time that you will continually allow us to remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the blood that was shed, the life that was lived, so that we could be part of his family. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask the ushers if they would come forward at this time. The Bible tells us that on the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said this would represent his body, which would be shed for us. Let's bow and give thanks for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of Jesus Christ. We thank you that 2,000 years ago, he came to this world. He had a body just like ours, and it was that perfect, sinless body that was nailed to the cross, that the blood was shed so that we could have the forgiveness of sin. And we pray that as we partake of this symbol, that our own commitment to him may continue to increase. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake of this symbol of our Lord's body. Ashley, Ashley, if they will come forward again, please. On that same night, our Lord took a cup and passed it amongst his disciples and told them that this would represent his blood which would be shed for us. Let's bow and give thanks for the blood of the Lord Jesus. Again, our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the love that you have for us, that you sent your own Son into this world. You sent him not only to live, but to die upon the cross, to shed his blood so that we could have the forgiveness of sin. And today, as we partake of this symbol, we remember. We remember your love. We remember his death. We remember his, his, his spilt blood. We also remember the love that he has for us, and we thank him for that. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's partake of this symbol of our Lord's shed blood. Our Heavenly Father, we rejoice this morning that you've opened our eyes and given us understanding and allowed us to know who Jesus is and have allowed us to receive him as Lord and as Savior. And we live in anticipation of his second coming. May we be faithful until that day when Jesus returns and claims us for himself. For he asks this in his name. Amen. If you'd pass your cups down to the end of the aisle, the ushers are going to come now and collect them. Let's stand together as we sing our last song, shall we? with all the earth.
something you'd like to pray about, they would love to spend some time praying with you as well. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we ask your blessing upon us at the beginning of a new week. We pray that our lives may reflect the life of Christ that is within us. May we be a testimony for your grace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Well, listen, again, we're glad that you joined us here at Church Online. Again, we invite you to come on back and let your friends know on social media that you were here joining us today. Uh, share, like, if you see posts, and uh, just let them know. Invite them to come on out to Church Online. And again, if you live in the Huntsville area, uh, we invite you to join us Sundays at 9.15 and 11 a.m. Come on out. Move from the online to the offline. Check out the community that is Faith Baptist Church as we're strengthening families towards a transformed community. Hope to see you soon. Bye.